and um, thanks to Tabitha for inviting me. And um, I brought some Michigan germs with me to California, so I hope that my throat is good for this whole talk. I have two kids in daycare, and that means I'm sick almost constantly. <laughs> okay, so humans have incredibly variable faces. If you look around the room, pretty much everyone's face looks different. And the fact that our faces are so different is an essential part of our social communication system. So just imagine what life would be like if everyone looked the same. It would be a crisis, right? <laughs> <laughs> so how would you differentiate your students, your partner, your friends? Our entire social system would break down if we didn't have variation on our facial features. So variation is essential for communication. Today I'm going to talk about two species of paper wasps. Both of them have variation in their facial features, and I'm going to talk about what they use this variation for, and how the communication systems of these wasps have influenced their social behavior and their cognition. So first up, I'm going to give you a little bit of background um, on their, so their social life. So this is a nest of Polistes and Manulus paper wasps. You'll notice that there are three wasps on the nest. <coughs> And Polistes dominulus often start nests in groups. And when they cooperate to found a nest, there's one wasp who's the dominant, and she gets all the reproduction. And then there's subordinate wasps who do all the work. So being dominant is very important. So not surprisingly, these wasps have very intense battles over dominance ranks before they start nests. So they come out of diapods in Michigan, usually around mid-April. Um, and they spend about two weeks flying around, fighting with lots of other wasps before they settle down to start a nest. These battles can be really intense. I've seen wasps actually sting each other to death. So competition is incredibly important in their life. So as I said before, there's variation in their facial patterns. And when you look at this picture, you can see there's a lot of variation in the number, size, and shape of black spots in um, the middle of their face in the clipias. So why? Why do they evolve this area? Now, as I said before, competition is really important in the social lives of these wasps. So I wondered whether the facial, these facial patterns were a signal that could be used to minimize the costs of competition. So I set out to test that, and the first thing I did is I took wasps and I had them fight, and then I measured the facial patterns of winners and losers. And what I found was that winners and losers have different facial patterns. So winning wasps, wasps that are more um, dominant, tend to have a more broken or black um, wavy spots on their face. Wasps who are more subordinate have no black spots on their face or little black spots on their face. So basically wasps with more edges in their facial pattern are more dominant than wasps with fewer edges in their facial patterns. Now this seems like a really strange signal, doesn't it? Edginess, why does that matter? But I'm talking to a group of entomologists, so you should know that uh, the insect compound eye is really different from our eye. And um, compound eyes can be particularly attuned to moving edges or edginess in a pattern. So I think that's why um, this is the component of facial patterns that matters to other wasps. Okay, so I've shown you that there's a correlation between winning a fight and facial pattern. But that's not enough to demonstrate that this is actually a good signal. I need to also do an experiment. So I set up a very uh, simple experiment to see whether wasps are paying attention to each other's facial patterns. Do they use facial patterns in making decisions about their rivals? So the way we did this is we took uh, a single wasp and uh, gave her the choice of two patches of food. Each patch was guarded by a rival. Now these rivals originally had the same facial patterns, but I used paint to alter their facial patterns of both of them, so that one wasp had two spots on her face and one wasp had uh, one spot on her face. Now I predicted if these facial patterns were a signal, then wasps should avoid the individual who had a more broken facial pattern. So she should avoid the individual with more spots and instead challenge the individual with fewer spots. So um, this is what the experiment looked like. You can see it's extremely high tech. <laughs> and you can see um, there's a wasp coming out to make a decision. Here are the guards. You can see um, the guards are actually dead because you can't get a live wasp to stay on a sugar cube for all the time. But fortunately, I was able to fool the wasps with this. You can see she's checking out that guy, that lady, and uh, but she's not going to eat. And then she goes over there and checks out this individual and decides to eat the sugar. So I would say she's made that choice. 
So we did this experiment lots of times using lots of different choosing wasps and lots of different guard wasps. And overall, the results are pretty consistent. So wasps preferentially challenge the individual with fewer facial spots. So about 80% of the time, they um, chose the individual with uh, a lower broken of facial patterns. So I was pretty excited about this because it shows that these facial patterns are actually a signal of fighting ability. Wasps are using this variation to make decisions. Now, lots of animals have signals of fighting ability. They're very widespread and very well studied. Most of the signals of fighting ability, there is a clear kind of inherent link between the phenotype of the signal and the information that's being conveyed. So for example, um, in deer, having a bigger rack is a signal that you're a good fighter, and having a big rack actually makes you a good fighter, right? <laughs> so these sorts of signals are relatively easy to understand. But paper wasp facial patterns fall into a different category of signals of fighting ability, often called conventional signals of fighting ability. Now these signals of fighting ability, there's no inherent link between the signal phenotype and the information being conveyed. A great example of this is karate belt color. So the convention is that someone with a black belt is signaling that they're strong, someone with a yellow belt is signaling that they're weak, but this is essentially an arbitrary convention. We could switch it around, and have yellow belt meaning you're strong and black belt meaning that you're weak, and that could also work. You can compare that with the antler example, and it doesn't really make sense how you could have a situation where having a smaller rack or no antlers would be what signals that you're strong, right? That doesn't make any sense. So conventional signals of fighting ability have been somewhat more controversial than other signals of fighting ability. People have even questioned whether these traits can actually be reliable signals. And if they are reliable signals, why do they stay reliable? What maintains this reliability over evolutionary time? So essentially, what prevents weak individuals from signaling that they're strong? Now, one of the popular um, explanations out there is the idea of social costs. So the idea is if you signal that you're strong, you are either going to receive, and you're not actually strong, you're going to either receive more aggression than that you would normally, or you're going to be attacked by other strong individuals, and this is going to be so costly that it's not advantageous to signal inaccurately. So we decided to test this idea. We wanted to see if wasps with inaccurate signals received more aggression than wasps with accurate signals. To do this, we um, took two wasps, and we forced a wasp to cheat by painting her face so that her facial pattern no longer accurately reflected her ability. And then we set her up in fights, and what we found is that wasps with inaccurate signals receive way more aggression than those with accurate signals. So it seems like social costs are an issue. If you signal that you're strong and you're not strong, you're going to get beaten up. <laughs> so this evidence for social costs I thought was really exciting because there's been so much controversy about the evolutionary stability of signals with social costs. But the more I thought about this result, the more I realized that there's some pretty, uh, there's some challenges associated with the social cost hypothesis. And today I'm going to talk about a couple of those challenges and what I hope may be solutions. So the first question is, why do receiver responses vary across the context? Now this question might have occurred to you if you've been paying very, very close attention to what I've said so far today. So today I've talked about two experiments. That I, where I forced a wasp to cheat by painting her face. In one experiment, in the choice trials, the wasps with inaccurate signals were avoided. The other wasps were like, hey, you look strong, so I'm just going to get out of your way. In the other experiment, I forced a wasp to cheat, and they got beaten up. So here are two experiments where I did the same manipulation, and I got completely different outcomes. In one case, cheating appeared to work, and in the other case, it really didn't. So that's the kind of uh, experimental outcome that's very distressing to a researcher, right? You hope that your experimental results are going to be consistent. So as I thought about this, this problem with my experimental results, I thought that, hey, maybe this isn't actually a problem. Maybe it's actually um, an important result that might help explain the evolutionary stability of signals with social costs. And the reason for that is if receivers always trust signals, then cheating can invade the signaling system. If every time receiver sees a rival, they say, oh, you're saying that you're strong, so I'm not going to fight with you, 
well then um, cheating can spread. There's no opportunity for social costs. If, on the other hand, receivers never trust signals, then there's no benefit associated with signaling. If every time they see a rival, they say, uh, you're saying that you're strong, but I don't believe you, so I'm going to fight with you anyway. Well, what's the point of having a signal if it doesn't help to minimize some costs associated with conflict? <clears throat> so I think that context-dependent receiver responses are actually required for signals and social costs to be, um, to be stable. So um, we already have some evidence that responses to signals are context-dependent. So we found that um, the, the consequences of signal inaccuracy varied across experiments. But I thought it would be nice to test context-dependent receiver responses within a single experiment. And um, what we predicted is that during competition over more valuable resources, right, receivers should test the signal. And during competition over less valuable resources, receivers should trust the signal. So the way we uh, did this experiment is we took a single loss and we varied the value of food by starving her. So in some cases, she wasn't starved at all. In other cases, she was starved either one day or three, day before, three days before the trials. Now, three days, sounds, three days of starvation sounds really cruel, but wasps can actually live for a month without food, so this isn't actually as extreme an experiment as it sounds like. OK, so then we gave this wasp the option of challenging or not challenging a rival for access to food. So in some experiments, the rival had no spots on their face, so that the rival was signaling that she was weak. And in other cases, the rival had two spots on their face, so the rival was signaling that she was strong. And I should say that um, all of the rivals originally had a similar facial pattern, and they were altered with paint. That's just additional confirmation that, that it's the facial pattern that's causing the differences in the behavior, and not some other correlated trait. All right, so what did the results look like? You can see um, what wasps who weren't starved at all really paid attention to the signal. So they challenge the individual with fewer facial spots a lot more than the individual with more facial spots. But you can see after three days of starvation, there was essentially no difference in uh, receiver responses to the signals. So this tells you that wasps were ignoring the signal when the value of the food was sufficiently high. So I think this is really interesting that um, there's so much flexibility in signal response. And I think it also is um, interesting in light of the controversy about whether conventional signals function as conventional signals are actually good signals, right? Part of the reason this controversy has persisted is because people have found different um, results across different experimental contexts. And that's led people to say, hey, you know, these things aren't even good signals. Sometimes they seem like signals and sometimes they don't seem like signals. So perhaps it um, has to do with um, Perhaps there's a good reason for that, and it's not just an experimental error or something. <coughs> OK, so I think that um, context-dependent receiver responses are important for the evolutionary stability of signals with social costs. So on to the second key question uh, that I think is associated with social costs. How do receivers identify inaccurate signalers? So how do they know another wasp is signaling inaccurate? I don't mean they have to know it consciously, but there has to be something different about individuals with inaccurate signals that's causing the increase in aggression. So a hypothesis um, originally developed by Siebert Rover long ago was that individuals might be assessing the match between behavior and signal. And his idea was, if an individual signals that they're strong, but behaves like they're weak, that's what could cause social costs. Now, this is a very uh, appealing hypothesis, but it had been difficult to test, um, in part because it's often difficult to experimentally manipulate behavior and signal independently. But fortunately, WASPs are um, a pretty good system to do this experiment. So we set up an experiment to test it. So what we did is we took two WASPs and we had them fight. Before the fight, we um, changed the signal and or behavior of one individual. So we changed the signal with um, paint, and we changed the behavior with juvenile hormone. So previous work in wasps has shown that juvenile hormone is correlated with dominance, and if you treat wasps with juvenile hormone, they're more likely to win contests. So this is a good um, way to do the manipulation. 
Okay, so we did four different um, treatment groups. In some cases, we changed the signal alone. So we made wasps signal that they were stronger than they actually were. In some cases, we changed behavior alone. So we treated them with juvenile hormones so they became uh, more dominant, but we didn't change the signal. In other cases, we changed both behavior and signal. In other cases, we're in complete control. Now we predicted that if it's the mismatch between signal and behavior that's causing the social cost, that cases where we change the signal alone or cases where we change the behavior alone should be associated with some type of social cost. So these are the results, the different treatment groups, and the number of aggressive acts received. And you can see in cases where we change the signal alone, the wasps received much more aggression than individuals from the other treatment groups. We were particularly excited that they received more aggression than um, the treatment group where we changed both signal and behavior. So if you signal that you're strong and you behave like you're weak and you're a paper wasp, you're gonna get beaten up. So this is some good evidence for the incongruence hypothesis, but for all of you who are paying close attention, you're probably saying, wait a second, what about these guys? So these guys, I changed their behavior so they were good fighters, but I didn't change their signal. So there was incongruence there, it was just in the opposite direction. So that they were behaving like they were strong and signaling like they were weak. Well, it turns out these guys did suffer a different kind of social cost. So usually when wasps fight, they uh, establish a stable dominance hierarchy. One wasp submits to the other one. Um, but you can see in cases where um, I change the behavior and not the signal, the wasps were less likely to form a stable dominance relationship. Now since stable uh, cooperation is really important in this species, I think that that also might be an important uh, cost. So regardless of whether a wasp signals that they're strong and behaves like they're weak, or behaves like they're strong and signals like they're weak, it looks like, in any case, a mismatch between signal and behavior produces some sort of negative social consequences that could potentially favor wasps who signal accurately over evolutionary time. So it looks like, I think we've supported Siebert Rower's incongruence hypothesis. The mismatch between behavior and signal gives rise to social costs. Okay, so on to the final issue. So is aggression, is receiving a little bit more aggression actually sufficient to maintain ornament accuracy? So I think this question um, kind of gets at a bigger issue in behavioral ecology. So sometimes we find evidence of some cost and we say, hey, there's the cost that keeps something honest. Hey, there's the cost that keeps things stable. Um, without actually going further and, and thinking in more detail about how much cost is actually sufficient to maintain signal accuracy or to maintain stability of various things. But I think this question is uh, maybe a bigger question for the research on social costs. And that is because um, people have had trouble coming up with good models wherein aggression really maintains ornament accuracy over evolutionary time. So theoretical models out there aren't, aren't so great. Although there are a number of interesting ones, a lot of them have, um, have components of them that might not be that realistic, as is often the case. Okay, so as I was thinking about this problem, I thought that, hey, maybe part of the issue is that people are, are just looking at aggression, and they're stopping after thinking about aggression. But we all know that social behavior has important physiological consequences. So thanks to a lot of prolific work on the challenge hypothesis, we know that aggressive behavior influences hormone titers in particular. So the specifics vary a lot from species to species and from context to context, but there are some pretty general rules. So aggression, off, uh, sorry, androgens often increase during periods of competition, they decrease when individuals receive aggression, they increase in contest winners, and they decrease in contest losers. They can also be influenced by sexual behavior. So although the specifics vary, it's very clear that social behavior, especially aggressive behavior, has a huge effect on hormones, particularly androgens. So whenever ornaments influence social and or sexual behavior, they're also likely to influence aspects of physiology. So instead of stopping and just saying, looking at social costs, I think we need to get go a step further and think about the physiological consequences of these social costs. So the, the general social cost model is that ornaments influence behavior, 
and these beha this behavior has some negative effect on condition that favors signal accuracy over evolutionary time. So I guess I'm proposing that we instead we think about more integrated costs. So instead of um, just looking at the behavioral effects on condition, we think about how behavior influences hormones, and then how hormones also and behavior both interact to influence condition. Now, these um, relationships are obviously very complex, but I think the basic message is very simple, and that is thinking about the, um, the cascade of physiological effects that social behavior is likely to have. Now, I think it's important to note that there are a lot of really fantastic physiological cost models out there that think about how aspects of physiology might maintain ornament accuracy. So um, the immunocompetence handicap hypothesis is one of the best known of these uh, models. And there's been a lot of lovely research on them, on it. And these models um, kind of come from two different perspectives. Sometimes people say that hormones are, have like a required link to ornamentation, and hormones also have kind of costly effects on condition. And so therefore, only the best individuals can afford to have elaborate ornaments. In other cases, people say, hey, an individual only has a limited amount of resources, and they can either they can only invest a certain amount in producing a costly ornament because they also have to invest in having, for example, a high testosterone fighter. So these physiological cost models usually don't think about the interaction with behavior. So I'm proposing that we think uh, in a more integrative way. Okay, so obviously we need a lot more empirical research to know whether this makes any sense. But I think the very uh, basis of this model is quite simple. It just has three simple requirements. First, signals have to influence agonistic behavior, aggressive behavior. Secondly, um, the aggressive behavior has to influence aspects of physiology like hormone titers. And third, physiology and or behavior have to influence fitness. So I'm going to talk about these three requirements of paper wasps yet. Yeah, we'll see whether or not it fits. So the first requirement, I hope I've already convinced you that signals in paper wasps influence, fight, influence agonistic behavior. So wasps with inaccurate signals receive more aggression than those with accurate signals. So now I'm going to focus on two. Does this increase in aggression have any influence on physiology? Does it influence the hormone titers of wasps? Now you might be wondering why I focused on androgens earlier. We all know that insects don't have androgens, and I'm studying an insect. But they do have this other hormone, which I mentioned earlier, juvenile hormone, and it has surprising functional similarities with testosterone. So the structure of these two hormones is quite different. The hormones work in different physiological backgrounds, but they have one key similarity, and that is that both of them um, mediate the fecundity versus lifespan trade-off. So in many species, testosterone and juvenile hormone increase fertility and dominance, and in many species, these, these, these hormones also decrease survival and immune function. So I think, think you can think about these two hormones as having surprising functional similarities. And I'm going to talk about how um, behavior influences juvenile hormone in paper wasps. So we wanted to know whether um, the JH titers of founders rapidly change in response to aggressive interactions. So we tested this by um, taking three founderses, and we put them in an arena and let them fight for three hours. And then we had a control individual, which is just one sad, solitary wasp all alone. At the end of the fight, we bled them and measured their juvenile hormones. And this is uh, an example of what the most exciting contest you could ever hope to see in a paper wasp looks like. This is in a different species, but you can see these guys are rolling around and trying to sting each other usually much less exciting. They just kind of like dart at each other and stuff. So at the end of these three hour trials, we um, let them. And what we found is that uh, the behavioral interactions did have a big effect on juvenile hormone titer. So you can see solitary individuals have kind of intermediate juvenile hormone titer. Individuals who won the contest in the groups of three had significantly upregulated juvenile hormone titer. And um, the individuals who lost the dominance contest had significantly so this tells you that JH is quite responsive to social interactions on a surprisingly short time scale. So we also found that receiving aggression actually decreases JH. So this shows you uh, juvenile hormone titer, 
and the number of aggressive acts that an individual received. You can see that when wasps received more aggression, they had lower juvenile hormone titer at the end of the fight than wasps who received um, less aggression. So as I showed you before, wasps with inaccurate signals receive more aggression, and receiving more aggression is associated with reduced um, JH. So I think this suggests that social costs are likely to have physiological consequences. Now, of course, the experiment that I need to do, which is in process but not done yet, is experimentally manipulating the wasp facial patterns so that they have inaccurate signals, and then directly testing the physiological consequences of that manipulation. And I think that'll be really exciting to find out the answer. <clears throat> so is um, this change down regulation costly? Is there anything bad about having your JH titer reduced? And obviously this is a case where a lot more experimentation is required to have a really definitive answer. But it's certainly plausible that it could be costly. And the reason I think that is because wasps have a fairly brief window during which competition is incredibly important. And competition during this brief window <laughs> sets the stage for their lifetime reproductive success. So when wasps come out of hibernation and they fight for a week or two, the winners of those fights are the ones who are going to be dominant and get the most reproduction. So winning a fight then is essential. I think this is parallel to many uh, other systems where, for example, there might be a relatively brief window during which mating happens or a relatively brief window during which territories are acquired. So I think it's commonly the case where being competitive during a certain time period is essential. And, um, and so it could be costly if you were less competitive due to um, some sort of physiological cost. OK, to summarize this section, uh, Felicity's Dominulus have a conventional signal of fighting ability. Response to the signal is context dependent. Wasps with inaccurate signals suffer social costs because of the mismatch between signal and behavior. Social costs likely have physiological consequences and I'm really excited about future work examining the feedbacks between ornaments, physiology, behavior, and fitness. And I think this will be exciting in a range of different systems. So I'm hoping that uh, more tests are done. OK, so now I'm going to turn to um, the second species that I'm going to talk about more briefly. This is Polistes fuscatus. It's the native paper wasp in um, much of the northern US. And Polistes fuscatus also has, sorry, Plistes fuscatus also have variation in facial patterns. But the variation is for an entirely different function. So Plistes fuscatus learn each other's facial markings and use them to recognize each other as individuals. Basically, when they fight, they learn each other's faces. They say, oh, you're Sally. And the next time they meet Sally, they don't fight with Sally anymore because they remember her from their previous interaction. So <clears throat> this system is entirely different. It requires a lot of learning and memory to function effectively. So you actually have to memorize the facial patterns of individuals you interact with and recall them during subsequent interactions. So that seems like a kind of a cognitively challenging thing for an insect to do. So we were interested in learning more about how good their individual memory actually is. So this is an experiment done by Mike Sheehan, who's currently a postdoc at uh, Berkeley, but um, was my grad student at the time. And he set up an experiment where he had wasps fight, he separated them for a week, and then he reintroduced them to each other. And he found that the wasps remembered each other for at least a week. And these memories persisted despite the fact that during the intervening week, they were living in a complex social environment. So they were living in a group with seven to 10 other individuals. So this is quite a good memory for an insect to have this kind of um, persistence in the face of um, a lot of other wasps that you were interacting with and persisting uh, over a week. So um, people were excited that the wasp could remember this for so long, but I think the reason is mostly because people sometimes don't look at insects and think about how great their memories are, but actually they're, they're incredibly smart, right? So I'm not actually that surprised about this result. How long do they live? They live uh, for a year. So a lot of that is hibernating, um, but that their active life is maybe five, five months where they're really doing interesting social things. OK, so but because they have a pretty good individual memory, it set up a situation where we could test this question about whether um, cognitive abilities evolve in a specialized or a generalized manner. So a lot of the things that animals do 
are mediated by very um, generalized processes that are phylogenetically widespread and they're used for many, many different kinds of tasks that animals do. Now this makes sense because animals do so many different things and you couldn't be specialized for each different thing that you do, right? That would be incredibly inefficient. But there are some examples of specialization that have attracted a lot of attention. And one of the best known examples of specialization is face specialization. So primates with individual face recognition are specialized for face learning. What that means is that we learn faces better than we learn other visual information. So this might be intuitive to you. You might not have ever thought about it before, but it's true. You go into a classroom and you can remember all 25 individuals in that classroom at the end of the class without um, trying very hard. But if you had tried to memorize 25 different distinct complex um, images during that same time period, it would have been much more difficult for you. So humans, we actually have a, a special part of the brain, the fusiform face area that's just for face learning, and we are quite specialized. So I'm going to show you a face, I want you to try to remember it. that modifying the face in any way makes it much more difficult for us to learn. <clears throat> so upside down faces, humans have an incredibly difficult time learning, and that's because our fusiform face area doesn't recognize them as faces. So that just shows you how incredibly specialized we are. So um, Plistis cuscatus are the um, only non-vertebrate with uh, individual face recognition. So we thought it would be interesting to test whether they're also specialized for face learning. Now we predicted if they are specialized for face learning, that individuals will learn faces better than other visual stimuli. And we were particularly interested in um, whether they learn faces better than patterns. So we trained wasps to discriminate pairs of faces. We also trained them to discriminate simple black and white patterns. We chose those patterns because people had previously used them in honeybees, and they're thought to be very easy for honeybees to um, learn. And then we also trained them to discriminate caterpillar images. We chose caterpillar images because polistes are um, predators of caterpillars. And then we also trained them to discriminate manipulated faces. So we took a normal face and we jumbled it up. And then we took a normal face and we um, digitally removed the antenna. So we chose to remove the antenna because we know that during social interactions, the placement of the antenna has, is really important. So we thought that white wasps might be particularly attuned to antenna um, in face assessment. So we trained wasps using a negative re reinforcement T-maze. The way it worked is that um, um, one image was associated with a safety zone, and then the other image was associated with an electric shock. And we randomly swapped the position of the safety zone so that wasps were actually learning the image and not just to go right or left. So this uh, work was part of Mike Sheehan's dissertation, and this is one of the many undergrads, Jackie Wright, who helped out with the training. So here are the results, showing you the percent of correct choices for the different um, images. You can see that wasps learn faces better than they learn patterns or caterpillars. And I was kind of surprised by this because these simple black and white patterns are so visually apparent and obvious. Um, especially when compared to the relatively subtle variation in facial patterns. So they also learn faces better than they learn manipulated faces. So even something as simple as removing the antenna from the picture dramatically reduced learning. So I think this is important because um, these manipulated faces are really the best test of specialization. If you, um, because these manipulated images are, are composed of the same colors and patterns, but just the manipulation has changed the way the wasp's brain perceives these images so that it's treated as a pattern instead of a face, and you can see that it um, greatly reduces their ability to learn. Okay, so this was great evidence for um, face specialization. And it was pretty, we were interested in the fact that this face specialization had evolved independently in paper wasps. And I think maybe one of the reasons that this face specialization evolved is its um, specialization could potentially be a really good way of dealing with learning um, something that has 
a restricted amount of variation, like a face is really predictable, so it's much more easy, it's much easier to evolve specialization for something that's so predictable. So maybe that's the way, the reason that face specialization um, seems to be one of the more common forms of cognitive specialization. Now one of the nice things about studying a paper wasp is you have a lot of closely related species that differ in their social behavior. And we have this species here, Polistes metricus, that lacks um, individual face recognition. Now if you look at these pictures, you can see they all look uh, completely identical. So these wasps do not naturally have facial pattern variation. And we've done experiments to prove, to show that they also lack individual recognition. So we think the reason that they don't have individual recognition is the nests are always started by one queen, and you don't need individual recognition when you're nesting alone, right? So we predicted that if the requirements of individual recognition have selected for specialized face learning, then species that lack individual recognition will also lack specialization for face learning. So Felicity's metricus will lack face specialization. So we trained Felicity's metricus to discriminate faces, patterns, and caterpillars, and you can see they were really bad at face learning. <clears throat> now this is kind of exciting. It suggests that they lack face specialization, but as I just showed you, they naturally lack variation in their facial patterns. So in order, to, we so we actually created some variation in their facial patterns using Photoshop because otherwise, how in the world could they ever learn, right? They'd be discriminating between two things that were identical. And it's possible that the way we created the variation was unnatural or bad, and that's why these guys were so bad at learning faces. So we decided to do a cross-species comparison. So um, the black bars show learning of um, species to status. This is and you can see that Polistes Fuscatus learn their own faces really well, but they actually also learn the faces of Polistes metricus better than Polistes metricus learn those same faces. So this tells you that it is that Polistes Fuscatus are just <coughs> exceptional face learners, and Polistes metricus are poor face learners. It's not something about the stimuli that was causing the difference. So it looks like specialization is a pretty evolutionary, evolutionarily labile trait that is um, favored by the requirements of their social life. So it, it, is not it is also important to say that there's no difference in general learning ability. So Polistes metricus and Fuscatus were equally able to learn the patterns in caterpillars. So it's not just that Polistes Fuscatus are smart and metricus are dumb, it's that Polistes Fuscatus are smart in this very one special thing, learning faces. So um, the challenge of individual recognition has shaped cognitive evolution in paper wasps largely via cognitive specialization. And we're interested in learning more about what's going on in the brains of these wasps um, that um, allows the specialization to occur. So um, I'm gonna, briefly, I'm going to talk about the fact that there's also some geographic variation in Felicity's status facial patterns because Allison and Jan, who is a master student with me, is currently a PhD student here. And she's from Pennsylvania. And like any good grad student, when she went home for holidays in Pennsylvania, she collected some wasps. I mean, what else are you going to do when you're on vacation? <laughs> and she brought these wasps back. And this is what they look like. So here are a bunch of uh, Lysis fuscatus from Pennsylvania. And you can see there's not very much variation in their facial patterns compared to the Lysis fuscatus from Michigan. Now, you might not actually be able to see that, but I can tell you, having looked at a lot of wasp faces, these guys are quite similar. And we actually quantified the variation and we found that the Felicity's Fuscatus from Pennsylvania seem to have, do actually have a lot less facial pattern variation than the species, um, than the population in Michigan. And when we trained these wasps, what we found is that the, the Felicity's Fuscatus from uh, Pennsylvania were really dumb. So they were equally able, able to learn patterns, but they did much more poorly at faces. So it seems like there might be some interesting geographic variation in the presence of individual recognition and face specialization within the species. Now, of course, you might be asking yourself, is this really Polistes fuscatus? Maybe it's a cryptic species, and that's entirely true. It could be a cryptic species. So we have to do more um, genetics to figure out how divergent the populations actually are. Nevertheless, it, it suggests that it is a really evolutionarily labile trait. <clears throat> 
specialization is a quite labile trait. Okay. Um, so today I've talked about two species of uh, paper wasps that have facial patterns that are involved in social signaling. So Plistes fuscatus, which has a visual recognition, Plistes dominulus, which have quality signals. Now these guys are not the only two species with visual signals. There's uh, Plistes asplumin, Plistes satan, um, plus some Senegastrine wasps. So visual signaling has actually evolved multiple times within the paper wasps. Now, one of the reasons that visual signaling, it was originally surprising to find visual signaling in paper wasps, is that people often think that insects rely more strongly on chemical communication, right? Chemical communication is incredibly important in insects. And sometimes it's thought that the compound eye is not particularly good at discriminating fine differences in visual patterns. So we were interested in testing whether there was, <clears throat> there's been any coevolution of visual signaling and eye morphology. So um, has the need for assessing visual signals actually influenced eye evolution in the paper wasps? So often um, people, there's been a lot of really nice research looking at the relationship between sensory systems and signal form. And a lot of this research it kind of goes in one direction. So people say, hey, the environment influences the sensory system of the species, and the sensory system also influences the types of signals that that species has. So one of the most nicest examples is in the cichlid fish. So people um, know that based on the turbidity of the water or the depth at which a species lives, that influences the visual um, acuity, or what, these, uh, what the visual system is like in a species. And the visual system then influences the kind of sexual signaling that a species has. There's been less research going in the opposite direction. So looking within a single species and saying, hey, does the signal form that a species have, has influence the sensory system of that species? A lot of research has gone in this direction looking at predators or parasites. So there's a lot of eavesdropping going on that influences um, sensory system evolution. But within a single species, I was really surprised to find there are really no examples of signal form in influencing sensory systems. Okay, so Judy Jin, who is a really fantastic undergraduate who's currently a um, PhD student at Berkeley, did these lovely eye maps where she looked at um, <clears throat> the size of the omatidia in the acute zone of a bunch of different paper wasps. And she um, measured the maximum facet diameter in 19 different polices and tested whether the acuity has co-evolved with visual signaling. So we did this in a phylogenetic context. You can see um, species here with blue next to them are those with visual signals. Species with red next to them are those without visual signals. And then we used a generalized least square model to look at the relationship between um, the uh, facial patterns and um, maximum facet diameter. And what you can see, not surprisingly, <clears throat> is that there's a strong relationship between body size and facet diameter. So bigger wasps have bigger facets. That's not surprising. But interestingly, there's also effect of, an effect of visual signaling on um, eye evolution. So especially in the smaller species, species with visual signaling have um, larger omatidia than uh, species without visual signaling. So it does look like, in, in some cases at least, signal form can um, influence sensory system evolution within a single species. All right, so thanks to um, some grad students who contributed to this project, Amanda Izzo, Martina, Catherine Crocker, Allison and Jan, and then some collaborators, especially Zachary Wang, who is uh, the JH measurement guru who I would be lost without, and then many undergraduates who have helped over the years. And thank you all for your attention.
So I, I guess I've kind of thought of it as the social system influencing visual signaling and then visual signaling influencing eye evolution. You're right, it's like hard to test directionality, but um, so it is conceivable it could go the opposite direction. But that was the in your initial system that you presented, did you check for any correlation between the visual system and any chemical signals that may be associated with your indication? Yeah, so we tested cuticular hydrocarbons because they're so important in a lot of social insect communication. And what we found is that um, cuticular hydrocarbons basically signal fertility in these wasps. So more fertile wasps smell different than less fertile wasps, but the particular hydrocarbons are not correlated with dominance. So rank has no association. Yeah. Um, with the first wasp you talked about, the Polistes minulus, was there any correlation between the black like, facial markings and the size of the wasp? Like did the larger ones tend to have more of the black yeah, there is a, a weak relationship between body size and facial patterns with um, <clears throat> bigger wasps signaling, also signaling that they're stronger. So that was one of the reasons it's important to do those um, experimental manipulations so you know that it's not size causing the effect, it's actually the facial pattern. Yeah? I'm sorry if this is a facial Yeah, we've done it both ways. Um, sometimes we add uh, black spots with black paint, and sometimes we uh, take away the spots with yellow paint. So, yeah. You mentioned that the, uh, the method of colony foundation affects maybe the importance of facial recognition. And so I was curious whether there's variation within Puscatus, not just in their degree to which they can recognize faces, but in colony founding patterns, polygyny monitoring. <clears throat> um, there is variation. No. But I don't think it's been very well quantified. It's more like anecdotal stuff that some, someone has. But I think that is a really interesting and important thing to do, especially now that we know that there's geographic, potentially geographic variation in um, individual recognition um, and visual signaling. It will be really interesting to look at the geographic variation and social systems that might be um, going on also. But we don't know yet. Yeah. So I almost lost myself in <coughs> Phil's question. But what is it that, how heritable is facial pattern in Fuscatus? Um, and if it's yeah. not heritable, what are the environmental components during early development that might influence the expression of facial Yeah, pattern? so in the species with a quality signal, which you didn't ask about, but I'm going to tell you anyway, it's not heritable, it's strongly condition dependent. But in the species with individual recognition, Fuscatus, it is strongly heritable. There, it's not influenced by diet. It's not, it doesn't vary across caste. So workers and giants look exact, and founders look all the same. So it's, it's just terrible. So what are the determinants of condition, <clears throat> and how reversible is it? I mean, presumably they go through a terminal mold into adulthood, and that's it, right? And their facial pattern. Yes, their facial patterns are fixed throughout all their adult life. So um, that sounds like quite a challenge for something, for like a signal of quality, right? Because your quality can change, you're suddenly starved, and you, uh, you know, you're not as strong as you used to be, but you still have the same signal. Um, but I think it's it's a common problem across a lot of signals because you know a lot of bird plumage they molt once a year and they're stuck with the same signal for their whole whole year. So it definitely introduces variation in the system, but there's still you know a signal, a strong signal there. Yeah. And to follow up that, Rick's question, I'm presuming that it's this, the, their experience. The larval stage that's going to determine what those patterns are. Then. Yes, it's totally their larval, larval, the, their, their larval diet. Yeah. I think it has to do with actually juvenile hormone during um, the last period of pupation also seems to have an effect. So it's definitely diet dependent. Yeah? You're losing degree of relatedness at all in the system. I think you particularly in the founders, um, the dominant female. Yes. Yeah, so there is, um, co founders are often related, so the subordinates could get some increased fitness benefits through cooperating, um, but actually it's, there's a surprising number of cases 
do a huge number of cases where co-founders are unrelated, and other people have shown that there might be some inheritance benefits. So if the dominant form of war to die, subordinates can take over, and it's such a great, um, they would get so much reproductive success that they get to take over that apparently it's worth their while to stick around even if they're not related. Yeah? What's going on with the drones? Do they have yeah. comparable levels of facial variation? Yeah, the males don't have any facial pattern variation. I see one, you've seen them all. Yeah, you've seen them all. <laughs> they have a different uh, sexual signal that's like spots on their abdomen um, that seems to be what females care about. Males are also really bad at learning faces. So, I mean, males are just dumb, basically. So, we're interested in learning more about why males are so dumb. It's a real problem. It's not really a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they're definitely, uh, they, yeah, they have no facial pattern variation. But they're not involved in the hierarchy of the colony, so it's not really that surprising. If you're looking for a subspecies name for that Pennsylvania yeah. Fuscatus, you could call it subspecies to San Juan. <laughs> 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 so, I feel like I don't quite understand one, one result that you said, so I just wondered if you could sort of restate it. Maybe it's the, yeah. where you treat the juvenile hormone when you said your result in a particular way, which is that they don't stop fighting or something like that. And I was wondering about winning, though. So presumably that, presumably that this, this is about winning the contest that you have the opportunity to make, and, and that may be correlated, but you didn't, you didn't say it that way. So I wondered, that was yeah, I don't know. I'm, I don't know what I said. But I think what I meant to say is when I treat them with juvenile hormones so that they're behaving like they're strong, but they're still signaling like they're weak, they're unable to win the fight. They just, um, oh, okay. it's so they less likely. Fighting, but they don't. Their, other, they their opponent doesn't strong. submit. Their opponent doesn't give up, basically. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't necessarily mean there's more aggression. It's just that their opponent doesn't uh, submit to them. And the submission is necessary for them to form these stable um, cooperative groups. So the ones that don't submit, do they usually end up dead? Is it does it go to the death kind of thing? No, they don't. They don't fight. They don't. No, they don't. Oh. I mean, they kill each other very rarely. So it's not that they end up dead. It's just that like they don't um, end up hanging out together happily, grooming, oh, and, you know, okay. starting a nest together. I see. All right. Well, thanks for all your good questions.